The Whore of Babylon is the first thing that most people think of when they mention the priestesses of Mesopotamia, from Sumer to the Babylonians. But how did women of the first civilization in the history of mankind live? Why were they literally considered priestesses of love and a model of debauchery? Is it true that every girl had to become a temple prostitute to get married? And why were the whores of Babylon the first ladies in literature, medicine and astronomy? Why were big ears considered beautiful there? And did women have a distinct language? So, what was the life of the priestesses of ancient Mesopotamia really like? Our protagonist in Hiduana, the high priestess of the moon, was in despair for the first time in her life. A living incarnation of the goddess, the Akkadian princess, the daughter of the all-powerful Sargon of Akkad, the poetess who was called the triple threat in ancient times, she wept. Not because she lost her position and was banished from the city of Ur where she had served the goddess all her life. Not because Lugal aunt, her brother-in-law who had seized the power, was harassing the high priestess, and this was the first recorded case of sexual harassment in the mankind history. Never in her life she had felt so weak. She wept helplessly because of her temple, the greatest temple in the world. It had been destroyed by an invader. Her goddess, whose connection she felt so strongly, had been banished. She was lost. Did her goddess leave her and her city? The Sumerians were a tribe who appeared in the south of Mesopotamia in the middle of the 3rd millennium BC from nowhere. Today they are called progenitors of modern civilization. For a whole millennium the Sumerians were the main players in the world history. They invented almost everything we have today, well, except the Internet. One of the world's leading experts in Sumerian history, whose book we recommend to you, Samuel Cromer, wrote, We still divide the year into four seasons, twelve months and twelve signs of the zodiac, measure angles, minutes and seconds in the sixties, as the Sumerians used to. By the way, subscribe to our channel right now, otherwise you won't see the next video where you will learn how did they raise children 100 years ago. And Hiduana was not a personal name, but a title. The high priestess of the moon god, the one who joined a king or a high priest in the temple on the top of the ziggurat. Yes, we are talking about the famous Sumerian sacred marriage ritual. She lived in a difficult time for the Tigris and Euphrates Valley between 2285 and 2250 BC. The father of our princess in Hidwana was Sargon of Akkad, who did an unprecedented thing. He united northern and southern Mesopotamia, the Akkadian and Sumerian people into a single country. He also proclaimed the goddess of love and war Inanna as his heavenly patroness. Inanna was sung by our protagonist with a special feeling. The thing is, she was the first female poet in the history of mankind. Just imagine she wrote her poems one and a half thousand years before Homer. Of course, hymns to the gods were composed before but their authors remained unknown. But Hiduana went beyond the official style of that time and sat in her hymns in the first person, I, in Hiduana. Moreover, the researchers found also complex mathematical calculations in her poems, Mesopotamia. The fact is men and women of Mesopotamia were not equal, not at all. Women completely depended on male relatives. 
firstly being at the mercy and under the protection of the father, then the husband, brothers, or the eldest son. Roughly speaking, a man stretched out his leg and waited for his wife to put on his slippers. A woman's life in ancient Mesopotamia was considered incomplete unless she had a good husband and several children. She had no own property. Cheating on her husband was punishable by death. A husband could even give his wife into slavery for debt or disobedience. There is so much to tell. Well, if you are interested, let us know and we'll make a separate video. Lives of men and women were so different that women even developed their own language, a distinct dialect called Emzal, women's language. Some sounds in that female language were pronounced differently and the fair sex also used some words and a few vowels that didn't exist in Amagur the main Sumerian language. After coming of age, a Sumerian girl couldn't simply stay in her father's house. She had two ways – either to get married or to become a priestess, the very one who went down in history as Babylon's whore. We must say that the priestesses, Naditu, enjoyed here much more freedom than married women. The Nadito lived in convents, but in reality they had their own homes inside these complexes. And they certainly were not typical nuns. They could make contracts, did business transactions which was forbidden to ordinary women. The records show that they were very active. Nadito of the god Mardu could even marry, but all priestesses had no right to get children. And Hidwana was not the only pietess among the priestesses of Mesopotamia. Some of them were brilliant astronomers, mathematicians and scribes. There is even mentioned a knowledgeable woman who harms people with the help of supernatural forces, simply put, a witch. Some archaeologists have suggested that there were schools on the territory of Kakum where Nadita girls were taught the sciences. But why then did such enlightened and independent priestesses of ancient Mesopotamia go down in human history as the whores of Babylon? But in the fact, according to the ideas which were reflected in European culture, from the Bible and Herodotus to James Fraser, the main business of the priestesses of ancient Babylon was temple prostitution. A common view is that in Sumer there was a division between ordinary prostitutes and Naditu, who were priestesses of love, literally. And despite the harsh patriarchal order, it was not condemned by society. The high priestess herself was obliged to participate in the sacred marriage ritual when the goddess and the body of her priestess united on the marriage bed with the king or priest which symbolized the god, so they repeated the marriage of heaven and earth. In small temples, the role of the deity was symbolically assigned to a stranger or other outsider, to whom the priestess had to sacrifice her flesh on the altar. This ritual meant to reproduce the magical act of the primary creation of all living creatures and ensure the further continuation of life on Earth. This was the most important rite of the annual cycle. Well, the minor priestesses were ordinary temple prostitutes. The famous history's father, Herodotus, wrote that every Babylonian woman should once in her life sit down in the sanctuary of Aphrodite and give her body to a stranger. The ancient historian Strabo described the custom of temple prostitution, according to which no woman in Babylon had the right to get married without performing the prescribed ritual, that is, give her body to the first person in the temple of the goddess of love, the heavenly whore. It looked like this. Marriageable girls came to the sanctuary of the goddess, 
tied headbands of rope and waited until we quote any stranger threw money into her skirt and joined her outside the sacred temple. They had no right to refuse, and the received money was sacred and belonged to the goddess. A woman sitting there couldn't go home without completing her duty. According to Herodotus, some of them remained in the sanctuary for three, four years. However, none of the numerous studies of recent years have found documentary evidence of the existence of temple prostitution in Mesopotamia. As for the wars of the Greeks, some modern researchers believe that they could misunderstand something, so to say, and actually describe the rite of the sacred marriage. Nadito means literally uncultivated land. And according to a number of modern researchers, they are not synonymous with prostitutes at all, even ritual. In the Code of Hammurabi, this word defined a special legal status of a woman who could manage property, perform financial transactions and conclude contracts, unlike wives and brides. Usually they were women of noble blood. In addition to being educated, Sumerian Nadidu priestesses apparently performed some ritual functions in their temple. Some of them served as scribes. They filled clay tablets with cuneiform script. That is, the Nadidu were like Greek hetieri, who enjoyed more freedom than women who did not have an independent lifestyle. Hetieri could choose their patron as well as change him when the relationship came to a logical conclusion. They were engaged in arts and could maintain a conversation about philosophy and politics. That's why the Hammurabi Codex calls Nadito sisters of God or consecrated woman. Our Nhiduana was the first princess who became a high priestess and set a tradition for several centuries after her, all of them were princesses only. The authority of the princess priestess in Hiduana was so high that after the death of her father, she remained the high priestess under the reign of her brother and her nephew. But then the rebel Lugal An appeared with an ultimatum, as the high priestess of Inanna in Hiduana had to enter the sacred marriage with him. She felt cornered, but then she wiped her tears and cleaned herself up. She decided to perform the most terrible ride that was too bad to talk about. At midnight she would meet her fate. But first she had to become good enough for her goddess and make herself beautiful. By the way, although there are more than 4,000 years between us and Inhiruana, we know exactly how she looked at that day, thanks to archaeologists. She had a small oval pendant on the forehead and crescent-shaped earrings. She picked up her hair above her ears, braided it with a gold ribbon and pinned it over her forehead in flat curls. According to the images, the ideal of beauty in Mesopotamia were large eyes and large ears, which symbolized vessels of wisdom. The more wisdom, there were the bigger ears and eyes were. And even then, blown hair was fashionable. Sumi ran ways to become blown will shock you. To lighten their hair, they washed it in lion's urine and were sitting in the sun for hours. Well, maybe hair didn't become platinum blonde, but looked pretty good. Mesopotamian beauties also fought with brittle and curly hair with urine, but this time they used camel's urine. And after that, they rubbed their heads with fragrant oils of sandalwood, myrrh, fruits, and roses. Neither men nor women of Sumir wore underwear. But until the end of their days, they had a magical double cord on the waist next to the skin, which protected life and health. In very hot weather, a man could appear in public wearing only a loincloth or completely naked.
Well, our protagonist was preparing to perform a rite which the previous high priestess described with fear. It was a rite of complete fusion with the goddess. Those who had followed this path for power didn't return, she said. After merging with the deity, their minds disappeared because the divine Inanna had been in their body. But Anhidwana didn't care, she had nothing to lose. Either the goddess responds and saves them, or Anhidwana prefers to die. Venus, the evening stars appeared in the sky and announced the end of the working day. At sunset, Inanna judged people's deeds that they had done that day. At midnight, Anhidwana would merge with her goddess completely. She smelled magical herbs on the altar. Her consciousness left her slowly. With all her being, she called her goddess, begging her to come. I went into a holy trance for you. I, High Priestess, I, in Hidwana. Let my tears flow freely like a sweet drink for Holy Inanna. Lugal An had taken everything away from me. By rejecting the greatest deity, he had ruined that temple, whose beauty was inexhaustible, whose charm was infinite. He appeared before me with a friendly face, but in reality he had malice in his heart. Then she lost consciousness. All that happened we know from Inhiduana. After waking up from a sacred trance, she wrote down her insights in verse. It was her most famous hymn, Nin Misara. The story goes that a miracle happened and her prayer worked, and worked great, so that Inanna sent them nine victories in the battles against the invader. The Sumerians assured that they had seen the fighting goddess herself on the battlefield. A rightful king, the priestess' nephew, could reunite two countries. Inanna became the patroness of the ruling dynasty since then, and Inhiduana got her position back. In the hymn she had acquired during the sacred trance when merging with Inanna was considered sacred and was performed during the rites. We know it thanks to a huge number of copies. The point is that it was used as a teaching text during the Babylonian period, which was copied by thousands of students who wanted to become scribes. You can't help but think about the sacred power of Inhiduana's lines. Just imagine they were written 4,258 years ago. It's hard to believe that she could make descendants hear herself through the time, when even the existence of her people has been forgotten. The story of the discovery of her works in our time is also intriguing. The oldest poems of mankind were discovered in the 1920s, but for a long time no one tried to translate them into literary language. Until Union psychoanalyst Betty Matter had an unusual dream. She saw a wand, which turned out to be Inanna's wand. That dream impressed her so much that Matter tried to find something out about this goddess. She learned about the existence of poems dedicated to Inanna written by the priestess in Hiruana. In order to translate the Sumerian priestess verses, the psychoanalyst spent 20 years to learn the language and contacted the largest specialists in Sumerian culture. So the goddess helped her faithful priestess to rise from oblivion once again. Betty Matters, a psychoanalyst, declares, In our Western religions, we do not encounter anything like this. And Hiduana's comprehension of this goddess opens the door to a completely different look at women. And here is what the British historian Paul Krivacek writes about the poetry of our protagonist. 
She is credited with creating the paradigms of poetry, psalms, and prayers that were used around the ancient world. Although her works were discovered only in our time, they remained prayer models for a long time. Through the Babylonians, they influenced and inspired the prayers and psalms of the Hebrew Bible and the Greek Homeric hymns. Even in the early Christian church, we can hear an echo of an Hiduana, the first named literally author in history. Here she is, the mother of all modern poetry, the priestess of Anana who has presented herself again after 4,000 years. Do like and subscribe if you enjoyed this story. Oh, and click on the bell so you get notified when the new episode comes out.